classmates, I want to welcome you to our week four lecture. I have a couple of topics that relate to chapters 13 and 15 this week that I'll try to make these brief as possible. And at the same time, kind of get your interest again. Uh, I apologize for my screen. It's, uh, you know, it's showing my right on my glasses and I can't see the screen without the glasses. So I'm, I'm tied to this. Otherwise I can't see what I'm saying or, or uh, whether this thing's working or not. But as it turns out, uh, we've got chapter 13, which involves inventory. The best way I know how to describe inventory is let's look at some of the most recent areas of change in inventory. When Walmart first opened their stores, they had about 60 to 65% of their floor space was tied up in back stock. Now, what's the problem with back stock? Any of you that are accounting or finance people, when that stock hits your floor, you own it. Whether you sell it or not is another matter, but you own it. And if you've ever heard of what we call loss or we call uh, the, the idea of losing inventory from the inside out, this is a big problem. And so companies are using what they call a JIT, just in time system. There's a number of different ways they're doing this, but just in time just simply means they don't want any of these items in inventory until they're ready or more ready to go into stock. They allow just a little bit, if you saw chapter 13, a little bit of safety stock, a little bit of residual there just to make sure that they can cover the high end of their selling rate and then they go on to uh, fill up their stock. Walmart now operates on about a 16% floor space tied up with back stock and they are unofficially, I can only say unofficially, moving to a what they're calling a direct shipment where you basically, they get the materials at the store and they do not have anyone putting items out from a back stock. It all goes from the truck to the floor. Why are they doing this? Well, the cost of keeping that inventory, you own that inventory. And so you're paying for that inventory, whether it's sold or not. You're paying for that inventory if someone walks out with it or not. You're paying for it anyway. So you want to keep inventory tight. Now let's look at a manufacturing facility. In a manufacturing facility, they are trying to maintain what they're selling plus what they're buying at the same time. Walmart has that same process, but manufacturing, they're assembling parts, as we might say, or they're using parts in a process if you're in a service component or service industry. So in manufacturing, they have what's called a, a what we call material resource planning, MRP. And we utilize systems such as enterprise resource planning or ERP. And then that may have remind some of you of a term we, or a software we call uh, SAP, which is a German company, builds the best ERP systems probably in the world right now. And uh, they're pretty handy to have depending on who your suppliers and customers are, because sometimes they can help you be able to communicate with them. And you can imagine a system that when you draw it from inventory to ship it, it affects on how you order for the parts that built that product all the way down to sending a bill to the person who bought it. These are pretty elaborate systems and only very talented developers can use these systems. Let's look at another issue. Uh, I like the idea of Dr. Peter Senge in his book, The Fifth Element. He describes a lot of the problems that we have right now with inventory control and inventory management. It's such a, a difficult process because of what's in store for everyone in the supply chain. In other words, uh, he uses a concept, and I ask permission to use this, just, just simply his terms, not mine called the beer game. And this is how he teaches a class where he uses an illustration of a small convenience store. And that little convenience store has forgotten uh, that they have got a ball game that week. 
And I'm just going to use this as an example of that convenience store. This little convenience store has used this, has used the same vendor for their beer for some time. It's a college town. They had a ball game. They didn't think about the ball game being in town. And about Saturday night, they sold out of every bottle of beer they had in the entire place. Their customers were mad. Everybody that walked in the door walked out mad. What are they going to do? Well, most likely they're going to go to that wholesaler. That wholesaler is upstream from them, and he stands between that purchaser or that small convenience store, his customer, and he stands between them and the big manufacturing facility, the bottling company above. Now, when what do they do? Well, this little convenience store, um, and just like all the other little convenience stores that didn't order enough, let's just say there's 10 of them. And so he realizes, well, I've always ordered 10 cases of beer. Every week I get the same 10 cases of beer. I, I never run out. I never have a, a lot of extra left over. So I'm just going to get those 10 cases. In this case, he runs out. Singay's point, which is very valid, what do you do? You overreact. And you say, well, hey, I'm going to avoid that from ever happening again. So give me 20, 20 cases of beer this week. Now, that's not a big problem for him. If he's got the floor space for it, he's going to stock that beer. He's going to put it out there. And he's probably never will run out. But that's not usually how he thinks. Because at the end of that first week, he's always used 10. Now, instead of that, that 10, he's got 20, okay? 20 cases of beer. He comes, the wholesaler steps back into the little, uh, little convenience store and finds out the guy says, look, I just used about the same 10 cases, so I've still got 10 cases. How many do you think he's going to order that week? That's right, none. Well, for that wholesaler, that's a bit of a problem, a little bit more of a problem if he's got 10 of his convenience store customers with that same problem. Each one of them have ordered nothing for that week because they ordered too much the week before. So what happens is, is that the company above them, now this is what we call the bullwhip effect, the customer above them, which is the wholesaler, on up to this big monstrous bottling company. Now that bottling company had to hire help because they had all these 20 case orders that doubled their production needs and the demand was higher, but it was artificial. It wasn't accurate. It was poor inventory planning. So what they have to do now is go hire people. They have to create orders, more labels, more bottles, more boxes, uh, more electricity, more everything that goes in it. And now when this guy, these same 10 uh, convenience stores come back and say, hey, look, we don't need anything, he's got to have a layoff. The further upstream you go, the further upstream you go, the more compounded the effect of poor inventory planning. So inventory has been managed in two basic ways. We're just looking at two very basic items. You've probably heard of these terms before. I'm pretty sure you have chapter three. But one of those is called, if that convenience store decides from now on, I'm going to take care of my own inventory and track how much I'm using on a daily or weekly or per shift basis. Now that's what we would call, he's going to then determine from what he's actually using, he's going to then attempt to forecast what he's going to use the next order cycle. Now in that forecast, He's going to simply say, I'm going to take from what I passed results, past uh, results, I'm going to determine what the potential future is going to be. And if you look at chapter 13, it gets very complex. It's one of the most complex items, but it's a lifesaver for the guy upstream. That bottling company up here who's been handed He's got payroll problems. He's got inventory problems. He's got material resource planning problems. He's got massive issues. He's now tied up money that wasn't 
uh, effectively used. So what can sometimes happen is that that wholesaler right here in between that retailer, the convenience store, and that big bottling company up above here, sometimes that wholesaler can work with the bottling company and they can come into uh, that convenience stores, those different 10 I pin stores we were just discuss discussing, and they can simply say, well, let's, let's look at what you've actually used. We actually keep track of that information for you. And in fact, you've never used more than 10 cases. I'm being very simplistic, trust me. It fluctuates a lot more than that, you want it to. And so what we're going to do is, we're gonna just, even though it seems like you're, you want, you want to overload yourself, you're never going to use more than this many cases. So let's just go with the 10. Another step, and by the way, we call this VMI, Vendor Managed Inventory, VMI. Now there's some elaborate systems. There's some really interesting stories on how companies that offer VMI systems or a VMI information. That's what Dr. Senge, Peter Senge was talking about is the sharing of that information between the bottling company, the wholesaler, and that convenience store is vital to inventory control. If that supplier has this information, it can help them in making a rational and effective decision, an effective way of managing your inventory. You can see why they would be very wise in providing that knowledge to them. On the other hand, if that convenience store doesn't take care of their products, they've got 20 cases. They could have done something with those other 10 cases that they're not going to sell that next week. They've tied up money. They could have bought something. If you're a small store, that may have been your payroll. That may have been part of your other uh, store needs or store product line that you weren't able to pay for that week. It happened to float a note for a week. We're being very simplistic, trust me. But you think this is just a small company. Walmart, give me the perfect example. In a distribution center, a Walmart distribution center operations manager. This is guy, he's the boss. He runs that entire uh, hundred mil, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of square feet uh, distribution warehouse there that they ship out to the stores. So he gets a call from one of their large customers. Let's just say that's Kraft Heinz. You've probably heard of those guys, right? Or uh, Colgate Palm Palmolive, or we might pick some others, Procter & Gamble. These are all big suppliers for Walmart. So what happens is he gets a call from one of these guys and he says, we're going to send you some safety stock you're going to get an extra order on this because there's a special coming out, a, a loss leader, they'll call it, means that we're going to put a special price to move these products in order to sell some other products. We're going to put those products out for an ad in a magazine, in a newspaper in your area, and you need to be stocked so that we don't lose sales and that you don't lose sales. Is this distribution operations manager go, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. What does he do? He says, thank you very much. I don't want that to happen. I want to sell all this product. Please send me that safety stock, that storage, the stuff I'm going to actually keep in storage. They don't keep a lot of it in storage, I'll tell you that much. So even in large, massive behemoth stores and, and retailers, they allow vendor managed inventory because it helps them. Now, on the other hand, the supply chain. Let's look at this same scenario, the convenience store, the warehouse manager or the distribution, oh, we we'll call him the warehouse, the middle guy, and this big bottling company above here. All of these guys have a supply chain coming into them. All of, even that bottling company, he's got suppliers. He's had to buy from suppliers all around for bottle caps, uh, labeling, you know, different mixtures for the blended, the recipes that they use, all kinds of casing materials. He doesn't make that stuff that comes there. He just bottles with that recipe as he's making their products and then sending them to the wholesaler, the guy there in the middle. So what's happening in industry right now from the supply chain side 
is these commercial outlets, the retail stores, are saying, well, we're going to keep less stock and we're willing to take a probability of a stock out. In other words, we're willing to take a low, say a two to three, maybe 5% probability that we may run out of product. And for that reason, we want you to, in that warehouse, get that warehouse close to us, a little bit closer, because that's a way we can replenish if we need to faster. Now that doesn't need, mean that they're going to buy less. It means they're going to actually agree to a certain amount, but they will, will, they're willing to pay a little more for that distribution uh, warehousing or wholesaler there to keep that stock close to them. Right now, this is huge in the United States. The number one, still growing double digits around the country is warehousing. Uh, Tulsa, East Coast, West Coast now on the fringe, there's uh, Las Vegas, big warehousing, Oregon, big warehousing. What they're doing is we need these massive amounts, but they can't ship them across the country. It take two days for these products to get there and move. So they're putting warehouses close by and they're willing to pay for having that product closer to them. So a little bit more, even though they may use less, just an idea to consider in supply chain. This is a big issue right now in supply chain. Now I wanna take just a moment and look at supply chain from a biblical perspective. And I've shared this with you before. We have one source in this life. That source is immutable eternal. He is supplier of all things. God is not only a supplier of salvation. He's a supplier of everything that you see on this planet, if the Bible is true. So how does that relate to us as individuals in relating to one another? Martin Luther used the phrase, he called it the masks of God. And these masks of God, he said, were all of those people that were doing their jobs all along the supply chain. In other words, when tomorrow morning, if I want to go out, go to the grocery store, and I pick up a carton of milk, gallon of milk, and I pick up that gallon of milk. Now, I'm pretty sure that in that back of that department store or that uh, grocery store, there's not some guy milking cows back there. If there is more power to them, I would hate to be, hate to see their agriculture department of agricultural inspection. But in that case, he's literally taking for granted that somebody somewhere has got some cows on their land and they're taking care of those cows. Somebody, uh, it goes right back just to go all the way. Just take milk. I'm just talking about milk, right? Just simple milk. And some of us drink a lot of milk. I don't drink that much but grandkids do. I grew up drinking milk, cow's milk. Um, any way you go, it boils down to the fact that that farmer, somewhere down the line, milks those cows. That milk is put into containers, picked up at the dairy, taken to a place for processing, bottled, kept cold, and moved to these department stores or these grocery stores as they're ordered. You just simply go pick up the milk. Luther suggested not so much the grocery store chain. This is 1500s, uh, actually 16th century. And so Luther is saying that the dairy maid who milked that cow, she had a calling from God. And everything she did in order to do the work that God had put in front of her is her calling. And that she does that well, she's giving glory to God, because God is supplying through her that milk that goes to other people. Maybe that milk that makes the cheese, the milk that makes the butter. All of these things that happen to us are all, they're not accidents. You don't control these supply chains. They just are there. Somebody else is doing all of this. We simply go and pick it up. There's just more work than we can imagine if we were to try to manage all of that. We're much more productive as a society because of all those masks, masks of God working 
to provide for us, that's God's hand. That's God's hand. I really like what Luther said, and I think it's profound that he clarified this to us. Consider that the next time that you're at a store, someone is waiting on you. Consider that person is there, not by accident, not because they couldn't get a better job. Don't judge that. Just say, this person is here. God put them here to serve me. How do you want to treat that person? And I can tell you this from a marketing perspective. If you mistreat someone on the other side of that counter who may be working there to serve you and you mistreat them, there's a good probability that someday they're going to look to buy your products that you may sell or distribute. Now what happens? So it's got to be careful. All of us, in essence, are masks of God. It's God using us to develop his supply chain. Industry just measures this stuff. Industry just tries to find ways to measure these items. So look at this supply chain all around you. God's hand working through these masks of God to reach to you. Not an accident. It's pretty profound when you stop and think about it. We're just looking at a company, maybe a large company, and the way that they operate. Isn't it glorious how God meets our needs? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you. We come to you, Father, not because we have answers. We don't. We're just sitting here amazed at what you do in our life every single day. And you do that through other people. And I think of this, Father, as a way that we work as teams in this class. I think of it as we work as we have different roles in this class, students, uh, faculty, we have a school with administration. All of these people are working to try to make everything work effectively and eventually trickles down to us. And Lord, we realize that we have everything we need because of you. It causes us to doubt our stinginess, our concern for not having enough when we realize that all of this is coming from you. And our real role here is to be careful and wise in how we use these blessings of yours. At the same time, try to find ways to utilize our strengths best and how to be most effective in our daily life. May we do everything we, uh, we do and say to your glory and honor today. Help our unbelief as we see this issue, which is basically, Father, you're asking us to trust you, which is total and complete dependence and reliance. No human being can be worthy of that. No, nothing, no thing is worthy of that. Only you are, God. Help us to be reminded of that as we study your word and as we see the truth revealed all around us, the rain, the sun, we don't provide a minute of that. You provide all these things for us. We thank you so much. And help, Father, help us to be the most effective and humble and glorious to your glory and honor, mask in your service that we can possibly be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for praying with me tonight, class. And uh, I'll talk to you next week.